Hey there, Golden Hawk Historians. Welcome back for another Flipped Learning video. Today we're going to be talking about the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment really led to new ways of thinking about society and changed everything, pretty much, overall. The essential question that we're going to be focusing on in this video is what new views did Enlightenment philosophers have about society and politics? Golden Hawk Historians will evaluate the impact of the Enlightenment on society, socially and politically. While you're watching, make sure that you're taking good notes in either Cornell or Outline format as we've talked about in class. It's okay if you need to pause or rewind the video in order to ensure that you understand all the information and that you're taking good notes. During the scientific revolution beforehand, the scholars in the Middle Ages had had a lot of questions about the natural world, and the only two places that they went were either the church or ancient scholars. The medieval thinking was geocentric, meaning that they believed that the earth was the center of the universe and that the sun, moon, and the planets revolved around the earth. Following the Crusades, there was a lot of cultural diffusion happening from the Middle East, and they started to test things and pose questions about the natural world. This new way of thinking became known as the scientific revolution, where you pose a question and then test that question. The age of exploration also had led scientists and explorers to have a lot of more questions about the natural world and to study it more closely so that they could answer questions about the places that they were going. Scientists eventually developed a new approach to investigation and discovery called the scientific method. The first stage in the scientific method was to identify a problem. Then you form a hypothesis or a question before you perform the experiments to test that hypothesis. Then you analyze the results of the experiments to form a conclusion. There's a lot of different people who made different discoveries during the scientific revolution that we still use today. The most important was Copernicus, who had came to the conclusion that the sun, not the earth, was the center of the solar system. The heliocentric theory was directly contradictory to the geocentric theory, and it's asserted that the earth doesn't revolve the sun doesn't revolve around the earth, but that the earth revolves around the sun. He was the first scientist to create a model of the solar system. Galileo Galilei supported Copernicus's theory by building the first telescope to observe the stars. He discovered Saturn, craters on the moon, and also discovered the Milky Way. An English scientist many years afterward, Sir Isaac Newton, changed the world of discovery by combining the ideas of astronomy, physics, and mathematics to, through his discovery of gravity. His new law of gravity helped him to develop a brand new form of math called calculus that was used to predict the laws of gravity. European doctors previously had relied on the work of Galen, an ancient Greek physician, but his work was inaccurate because he had never dissected a human body, rather was dependent upon animals. Uh, during the Middle Ages, Andreas Vesalius became known for his work on the human body because he actually was given the opportunity to dissect the bodies of criminals by a monarch. Due to the innovations in the magnifying glass, a new scientist, Robert Hooke, used an early microscope to describe the appearance of plants at a microscopic level. He was the first to identify the cell. Robert Boyle, another scientist, is called the father of modern chemistry because he was the first to discover tiny clusters of particles that we now refer to as atoms and molecules. His great of achievement, however, was the changes in matter that happen when these clusters are rearranged in his studies on gases. The church had been the primary resource for knowledge and learning through the establishment of schools during the Middle Ages. Most of the European scientists were Christian, and they didn't want to challenge the role of Christianity in society, and Christianity was directly contradictory to many of the ideas during the scientific revolution. They wanted to explain the, the world through reason, but the church rejected reason as an enemy to faith. They felt like people were inherently sinful, and therefore they couldn't have these ideas. Heliocentric theory directly challenged the church's idea of geocentric theory. Galileo, despite conflict with the church, continued to support Copernicus's theory. He even stood trial before the Catholic Inquisition, where he agreed not to use Copernican theory in return for an easy sentence of house arrest for the rest of his life. As the scientific revolution took off, people began to question other parts of society, such as government, religion, education, and economics, which leads us to the Age of Enlightenment. The scientific revolution had convinced many European thinkers that the power of reason and its ability to be used to solve all human problems, this became known as the Enlightenment, in which people became enlightened or became their own thinkers. It's also called the Age of Reason because they focused mainly on the power of reason or logic, the ability of humans to think through th problems and come up with solutions on their own. 
Many Parisian women and other rich people began hosting social gatherings called salons in which they brought together philosophers, artists, scientists, and writers regularly to discuss enlightenment ideas. These became pretty popular social events, and the more well-known philosophers you had at the salon, the better you were going to be. There's main key enlightenment ideas that we need to keep in mind when we're thinking about the enlightenment. One is that the ability to reason is what makes humans unique. This idea of reason is the most important part about the Enlightenment. The second thing is, is that reason can be used to solve problems and to improve people's lives. The second thing is, is that reason frees people from ignorance, superstition, and unfair government. When you're thinking of reason with these two ideas, we're thinking of mainly of a people's ability to think through problems and solve them on their own. The natural world, and lastly, another enlightenment idea is that the natural world is governed by laws that can be discovered through reason and through the scientific um, method. Like the natural world, human behavior is also governed by natural laws. And then the last thing is, is that these governments should reflect these natural laws and encourage education and debate overall. There are some major Enlightenment thinkers that you need to know in order to be successful. The English thinker Thomas Hobbes wrote in his book, Leviathan, that people need a government in order to impose order. Thomas Hobbes had lived through the English Civil War and knew that a government was important for people not to uh, go into complete and utter chaos. He argued that some people should give up their freedoms in exchange for peace, safety, and order. This is called the social contract theory in which people enter into a social contract with the government in order to have these certain freedoms. English philosopher John Locke believed that people were naturally happy, tolerant, and reasonable. He argued that every man has the right to life, liberty, and property. It was these ideas that influenced the American Constitution, and we came up with our ideas of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Locke believed that the purpose of the government was to protect people's natural rights, and their natural rights were those three things, life, liberty, and property. If they didn't protect those rights, then they had a right to revolt and overthrow the government. Jean-Jacques Rousseau believed that people were born good and that it was society overall that corrupted people. He believed that the government should work for the common good of the citizens, even if that meant that some people had to give up their rights to benefit the community as a whole. He believed that all people were equal and should be recognized as equal in society. Baron de Montesquieu argued that the best form of government included a separation of powers that prevented any individual or group from abusing his powers. Montesquieu is where we get our idea of checks and balances. He believed that the government should have checks in them against the power of others, and that should be done through dividing the government into branches that served as that checking power on another one. Mary Alret was also known as Voltaire. She was one of the, he was one of the main people who attacked injustice wherever he saw it, among the nobility, the government, and in the church. He started questioning these institutions that encouraged common people to question the institutions as well. Denis Diderot was the first to compile all the human knowledge into a single work now called the Encyclopedia. His 28-volume uh, encyclopedia was helped to spread Enlightenment knowledge across Europe and explained new ideas about art, science, and government, and religion. The church didn't really like this encyclopedia because it gave people too much access to information that they didn't want them to have access to. Mary Wollstonecraft rejected the common view that women's roles were as wives and mothers. She was the first feminist. She demanded equal rights for women, especially in education, and argued that if women had equal rights in education, then they should also have an equal standing in society. Lastly, Adam Smith used reason to analyze economic systems. In his book, Wealth of Nations, Smith argued that business activities should take place in a free market. He was a strong believer in laissez-faire economics, or this idea that an economic system works well without government regulation. He was the first to play around with the ideas of capitalism. Many of the Enlightenment ideas inspired monarchs to develop systems of government in which they ruled according to enlightenment ideas. These monarchs became known as enlightened despots. There's two main enlightened despots during the end of the Renaissance era that we need to know. Frederick II was the king of Prussia and he believed that his duty was to rule as an absolute monarch to build Prussia's strength, but he also enacted many reforms in order to improve society. The first thing that he did was establish a system of education for all Prussian children. He also abolished torture and supported many forms of religious tolerance. However, he did check religious tolerance to a certain extent because he did want there to be unity overall. 
Catherine II of Russia dreamed of establishing order and justice in Russia while supporting education and culture. She drafted a Russian constitution and code of laws, but they were never put into place. She came right after um, Peter the Great, and so she continued some of the reforms that he had done with education previously. Make sure that you read back over your notes to be sure that you have all the necessary vocabulary given to you. Thank you for joining me for this video, and we'll see you in class.